Welcome to the School of Wisdom, a weekly podcast produced for the Bible Bistro, studying the book of Proverbs chapter by chapter. My son, hear the instruction of your father. Forsake not the law of your mother, for they shall be an ornament of grace to your head and chains about your neck. Now, this week's lesson. Hey there, friends. Welcome to the School of Wisdom podcast here in the Bible Bistro. This week, Proverbs chapter 22. If you'd like to get the outline for Proverbs chapter 22, you can go to my-dailydose.com. There in the blog roll, you'll find the outline for all of these chapters. And today's will be right there in the blog roll entitled Outline for Proverbs chapter 22. While you're there, Check out some of the other great things that you'll find in the website. Today we're looking at chapter 22, and you'll notice that uh, we have, I've sort of divided this up according to margins. I've indented certain verses because they go with other verses that are like it. For example, you'll notice verses 8, 9, and 11 all go together. He that does something, he that so with he that hath a bountiful eye, so forth. And you'll also notice verse 6 goes along with, uh, on the next page, verse 15. It's about training up a child. Verse 2 is also uh, one of those that I uh, use the margins to set back and indent. So the the rich and the poor, and then we have in verse 7 the rich. So verse 2 and verse 7 go together. So those are just some of the features here. I've also highlighted the Lord's name, which occurs six times, I believe, in this chapter. Yep, six six different times. Principally, the, the, the one that stands out above the rest is verse 4, and we'll get to that verse here in just a minute. Verse 1, A good name is rather to be chosen than great riches and loving favor rather than silver and gold. Probably one of those uh, verses in the Proverbs that people know very well. A good name is rather to be chosen than great riches. That one, just that phrase is probably what's remembered or known amongst the general population. And it's so true. This is not about your name, you know, whether it's Stephen or Barbara or John or June. It's, that's not what it's talking about. It's talking about the reputation of your character your integrity. If it's well known, then that's something that you want rather than great riches. So a good name that is your character and integrity is better than, it's greater than uh, riches and loving favor rather than silver and gold. The rich and the poor meet together. The Lord is the maker of them all. So the Lord is the one who's sovereign over all this. We have his makership, if I can put it in those terms, mentioned here. He makes both rich and poor. He doesn't discriminate between the two. A prudent man foresees evil and hides himself, but the simple pass on or punished. So here is a prudent man. We had a a good name in verse 1, and now we have the prudent man in verse 3, and he foresees evil. That is, that he forecasts what's about to come, and he prepares for it. He hides himself. So a storm's coming, You need to make provision in the storm shelter and get your family down there. The prudent man does that. He sees it coming and hides himself, not necessarily from the tornado or the storm, the physical storm. Of course, a prudent man would do that too. But this prudent man foresees something evil is about to happen. He's looking ahead. It's not that he's prophesying. You know, this is not some spiritual ecstatic utterance. But this is a prudent man who can read the leaves on the tree. You know, when I was a boy, we used to say it's going to rain because if the leaves turned upside down on the maple trees, that was a sign that rain was about to come. And a prudent man can see that, read those leaves, and then he knows what's about to happen. But the simple man, he's not that way. He just goes right on. He heads into the storm. And he's punished because of it. Well, he's punished because he runs into evil. He doesn't hide himself from it. A prudent man's able to see it coming. Verse 4, 
By humility and the fear of the Lord are riches, honor, and life. I made a great deal of this when I was teaching it to the congregation because I think that this verse probably puts together the book of Proverbs better than any other one verse. The book of Proverbs wants us to understand that humility and the fear of the Lord, that combination, produces all the good things that we find in the book of Proverbs, riches, honor, and life. And so something to keep in mind is that this is true no matter who you are, where you are, what time you are. This is always true. Humility and the fear of the Lord are riches, honor, and life. So this is how they come. This is how we receive them. And if you want those things, if you want riches, honor, and life, not that you are guaranteed that, but it's they come by humility and the fear of the Lord. They don't come any other way. Now, you might have riches, and you might have it by connivances, and you might have it by pride and so forth, but it's not going to be lasting. All of this is lasting because it comes by humility and the fear of the Lord. So verse 4, I think, is our our topic verse. It is the, the verse. It is our uh, choice verse of the chapter. Thorns and snares are in the way of the froward. He that doth keep his soul shall be far from them. And that's a parallel to verse 3. The, snor- the thorns and snares in the, of, in the way of the froward is like the simple man. He passes on and is punished. But the prudent man foresees evil. That is, uh, he that keeps his soul is hiding himself from evil. He will be far from thorns and snares. Then we have another verse that is very, very popular. It's one that a lot of people know. And that is verse 6. Train up a child in the way he should go. And when when he is old, he will not depart from it. What is the way a child should go? If you train up a child in the way he should go, that is, if you catechize him early or her early in life, training them up in the way of the Lord, not only teaching them at home, but also demonstrating that doctrine in lifestyle and in Sabbath attendance and all of the rest, then that child, when they are older, will follow that way because they're taught. A child that is untaught does not learn the good way. He learns corruption and foolishness, and he he or she adopts that for their lifestyle when they are old. But if you train up a child in the way he should go when he's a child, when she's a child, then when old age comes or old comes, whatever old means here, whether it means 20s, 30s, 40s, or 50s, don't know, uh, the child will return. The person will return to the training. And that's always the case because training early leads to profit later in life. The rich ruleth over the poor, and the borrower is servant to the lender. Now, this is another one that is very popular. As a matter of fact, there's a certain um, financial teacher on the radio that uses this verse all the time. And he's right to. Because it's a truth that never fades from generation to generation. If you're borrowing money, then you're a servant to the lender. Loans only lead to servitude. They don't lead to freedom. Because you still have to pay back the loan. And you're going to have to pay back the loan if you're going to be a man or a woman of integrity. Verses 8 and 9 and 11 all work together. He that sows iniquity shall reap vanity. The rod of his anger shall fail. He that hath a bountiful eye shall be blessed, for he giveth of his bread to the poor. He that loveth pureness of heart, for the grace of his lips, the king shall be his friend. So all those work together there. He that sows iniquity shall reap vanity. That just reminds me of, I I don't know if I mentioned it on this program or maybe on Daily Dose Radio. I mentioned Galatians chapter 6, Be not deceived, God is not mocked. For whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. For whoever whoever sows to the flesh shall reap from the flesh corruption. Well, that's this verse. He that sows iniquity shall reap vanity. The rod of his anger shall fail. He that hath a bountiful eye shall be blessed, for he giveth his bread to the poor. So the giver, we've seen this man, this giving man, over and over again here in the book of Proverbs. We're taught about him in the New Testament. We've taught about him here in the Old Testament. The bountiful eye shall be blessed. Verse 10. 
Cast out the scorner, and contention shall go out. <laughs> Yea, strife and reproach shall cease. Is that the truth? Of course it is. This is another one of those eternal truths. If you remove the scorner from the, from the scene, you're going to have peace. Strife and reproach will cease. Why? Because the scorner's not there any longer. There's no contention any longer. Because the person who is scorning is gone. So cast him out. If you want peace, if you don't want strife, if you don't want reproach, if you don't want contention, get rid of the scorner. Verse 12, the eyes of the Lord preserve knowledge. He overthroweth the words of the transgressor. So the Lord is not only hearing your words, he's seeing your words. He preserves knowledge and he overthrows the transgressor in those very words. If you look at verse 13 now, the slothful man saith. Now, notice how that comes on the heels of the Lord sees. What is that? The, the eyes of the Lord preserves knowledge, and he overthrows the words of the transgressor. Now we're going to have two verses right in a row that deal with words. The slothful man saith, there is a lion without. I shall be slain in the streets. If you're lazy, you're always going to find a reason to be lazy, not to work. And here's his language. The Lord sees that. The mouth of the strange woman is a deep pit. Well, why is the mouth of a woman, a, a strange woman, a deep pit? And here's the strange woman. We haven't had her since chapter 9. So this is a deep pit. Why is that? Because her words, her vain words, tempt and entice the man who is tempted and enticed. Here, the abhorred of the Lord, tempted and enticed. And he falls into those words, that deep pit, and of course he's destroyed by it. Verse 15 is another passage that deals with the child. Now we've already seen the train up a child in the way he should go. Here we have the foolishness is bound in the heart of a child, but the rod of correction shall drive it from him. The child not only needs to be trained up in God's way, and the only way to do that is is two ways. Number one, to catechize the child in the way of the Lord. And number two, to discipline the child so that they understand that foolishness is just that. It's foolish and they need to be able to identify it in themselves so that they can run from it. The rod of correction helps do that. So two things that are important to child rearing. Number one, catechizing. Number two, discipline. He that oppresses the poor to increase his riches, and he that gives to the rich shall surely come to want. I'm not sure I need to make too much comment on that, because that seems to be an obvious statement, doesn't it? You oppress the poor to increase riches, or you give of your riches to the rich, you're going to come to want. And to give your money to the rich is interesting, isn't it? Because you must be doing it for favor. You're trying to buy favor, or access, or popularity, or something. So if you do that, there's no return there. The only return that comes from giving money is for the man who back there in verse the verse oh yeah, verse nine. He that has a bountiful eye shall be blessed, for he giveth his bread to the poor. That man is going to be blessed. He's going to have a return. But the man who gives his money to the rich so that he can buy favor or access or popularity or whatever, what's he going to have? Nothing. Then we have verses 17 through 29, and here we have the wise man speaking directly to the reader or the student. If you have the outline, you'll see that I have a great big bold title centered right there in the middle of the page. Verses 18 through 21 introduce this and give us statements that we had back at the beginning of the Proverbs. In chapters 1 through 9, we had these my son statements. Well, here we have the wise man or the teacher speaking again to the student. Bow down thine ear and hear the words of the wise and apply thy heart to my knowledge. How many times have we heard that? That's been a command of the Proverbs over and over and over again. This is our call to come and study, to be a student in the school of wisdom. It's a pleasant thing if you keep them within thee. They shall withal be fitted in thy lips, verse 18. Again, another promise. It's going to be a good thing, pleasant thing, if you have them within you, they shall be fitted in thy lips, is a promise, but it's only a promise for those who bow down their ear, hear the words, and apply the heart. Verse 19 and verse 21 provide the conditions. 
These are the results, rather. That thy trust may be in the Lord. I have made known to thee this day, even to thee. And then 21, that I might make thee know the certainty of the words of truth, that thou mightest answer the words of truth to them that send unto thee. So to prepare you for a lifetime of helping others and for a lifetime of service to the Lord, 19 and 21 stand as signals there to that ability. But it only comes if you bow down your ear, hear the words, and apply your heart. You must do that. And 20, we have this first person, uh, 20 and 21, well, actually 19, 20 and 21. I have made known to thee in 19, have not I written to thee in 20 and 21 that I may, that I might make thee know. And so we have these first person, who are we talking about here? Who's the I behind this? It's Solomon, of course, that's where we begin. He's the writer of the Proverbs, but past Solomon, let's go to an eternal idea. This is the Lord speaking. He's the one that has written these things to us. I mean, Solomon was the instrument, but the Lord's the one behind it. That I might make thee know, well, the Lord is trying to make us know. He wants us to know the certainty of the words of truth that we might be able to answer the words of truth to them that send unto us. So people are going to come and ask us questions. How are we going to give them words of truth if we ourselves don't know those words? Again, we must bow down the ear, hear the words, and apply our heart. And then we'll conclude today with the four commands and an observation. Rob not the poor because he is poor. Neither oppress the afflicted in the gate, for the Lord will plead their cause and spoil the soul of those that spoiled them. So rob not the poor there is the first one. That's the first command. Verse 24, make no friendship with an angry man. That's the second command, verse 24. Third command is there in verse 26, be not one of them that strike hands. The fourth command is there in verse 28, remove not the ancient landmark. And then the condition, or the observation here, is in verse 29. See a man that is diligent in his business? He shall stand before kings. He shall not stand before mean men. That word mean there means obscure or uh, unknown men. So he's going to stand before kings because he's diligent in his business. That's a wonderful observation. And of course, these four commands and this one observation, we've seen this over and over again in the book of Proverbs. Notice that we have uh, in verse 23 and in verse 25 and in verse 27, we have reasons why you need to obey these commands. Rob not the poor. Why? For the Lord will plead their cause. So the Lord is the poor's advocate. You don't want to be on the wrong side of the bench of the law uh, when the Lord is the advocate for the poor. Notice what happens to the person who does rob the poor. Uh, the Lord will spoil the soul. Just like the person has spoiled the, the poor, the Lord will spoil the soul of those. You see? Again, verse 25, here's why you don't want to make friendship with an angry man. You'll learn his ways and get a snare to your soul. These are the reasons annexed to these commands. Verse uh, 26 is the command, be not one of them that strikes hands. Verse 27 is the reason annexed, if thou hast nothing to pay, why should he take away thy bed from under thee? If you don't have anything to pay, why are you standing for somebody else's debt? Don't do that. We've been told that over and over and over again in the book of Proverbs. Verse 28 doesn't have a reason annexed. It's just a straightforward command. Don't remove the ancient landmark. Remove not the ancient landmark which thy fathers have set. And then verse 29, I've already made mention of this, the diligent man, he is important because he's the one who, with integrity, does his business. Well, he's going to stand before kings. Diligence tends to lead to that. He won't stand before mean men or obscure men. Well, that's chapter 22. I hope that you'll go out and get the outline and study this for yourself. And I hope you'll join me next week as we study Proverbs chapter 23 on the School of Wisdom podcast. Hey, thanks for listening to the School of Wisdom podcast. 
If you're listening to this over YouTube, hit that subscribe button and ring the notification bell so that you'll be notified every time one of these podcasts is uploaded. I really appreciate all my followers, and I try to respond to each and every one of your questions. Come again next week, and we'll enjoy another lesson in the School of Wisdom.